Hello and welcome to At the Forefront Live. A lung mass can be a frightening discovery. However, not everyone who receives an abnormal CT scan should be rushed into surgery. Today, there are better insights into cancer and other lung diseases. Advanced technology and minimally invasive options are available. Dr. Ajay Wag and Dr. Kyle Hogarth will discuss the latest in lung nodule diagnostics, management, and treatment. And as always, we'll take your questions during our 30-minute program. That's coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. Let's have each of you start off by introducing yourselves to our audience and tell us a little bit about what you do here at U Chicago Medicine. And Dr. Hogarth, we'll start with you. It sounds like you're in a busy, busy place. Oh, I apologize. Um, yeah, okay. I'm actually in the endoscopy suite. Um, uh, so uh, my name is Kyle Hogarth. I am a professor of medicine here, and uh, I have been working at the University of Chicago uh, since 1998 and was fortunate enough to start the bronchoscopy program here and the nodule program and um, basically work very hard to make sure that uh, patients get the answers that they need to help decide what's the best next path when they find an abnormal CT scan. Because an abnormal CT scan is terrifying and you want to have something reliable in what to do next. See, this just shows how important uh, it is that we do these programs. Our, our doctors will actually even join us from the places where they're uh, they're doing the, the work. <laughs> Dr. Wag, let's, uh, let's hear a little bit about you. I, we just talked a moment ago and you're, you're pretty new here. Yes, sir. Uh, well, my name is Ajay Wag. Uh, I'm new here to the University of Chicago and very thankful to be here. Uh, I'm uh, grateful to participate in Dr. Hogarth and Dr. Murgu's team. Uh, we have a great team here and uh, I'm excited to be part of it. Um, I recently completed a uh, interventional pulmonary fellowship uh, which uh, brought me here. And prior to that, I was a private practice pulmonary critical care doctor for six years. Uh, so I'm uh, excited to be here in the city and, uh, and part of this program. Well, we're, we're very happy to have you. And uh, of course, you, you came here at kind of an odd time during a, a pandemic, but I'm sure you'll enjoy U Chicago Medicine. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. And the city of Chicago is, is a great place and a lot of fun. So let's yes, start sir. off with our questions. And, and Dr. Hogarth, I'm gonna start with you. And if you can just kind of set the stage for us and tell us a little bit about nodules and masses and, and what are they and how do, how do people even know that they, they have such a thing in their lungs? Yeah, sure. Well, so if you've had an x-ray or a CAT scan, there's a chance that the word nodule or mass is gonna show up in the report. And it's something solid. If you think about it, the lung is mostly air. And so think of it like a sponge. Um, so something solid inside the lung needs an explanation because there shouldn't be something solid in the lung. But there's many things it could be. And without a doubt, the possibility of cancer is what scares everybody. But the first thing to understand is there's a long list of not cancer reasons you could have a nodule in your lung. And teasing out what's what is what Ajay and I do. Um, he and I and, and our other partner, Dr. Murgu, work very hard to make sure that if you need a procedure, it's the right procedure. If you don't need a procedure, we you know because there's no chance that this is cancer, we would like to avoid doing anything invasive on you. And I think that's the first key step, getting an, an expert opinion about what could this nodule actually be and using some of the tools that we have. And then if we do need to do a biopsy, making sure the correct biopsy gets done so that you get an answer as to what this nodule actually is. You know, and I want to talk a little bit more about biopsies here in just a minute because it's interesting how you do them in the lung. We're going to get to a little bit more detail of that one here in just in a moment. But Dr. Wag, can you talk to us a little bit about just, I, I think as Dr. Uh, Hogarth just mentioned, if somebody comes in and sees a physician and they hear, oh my gosh, I've got a nodule, the immediate reaction is you're, you're probably frightened. Is that, should you be frightened or is this something that's, that happens and, and you just need to, to get it checked out or is that, that the moment of, of panic at that point? Well, I, I think that there's several uh, possibilities and I think we like to take things one step at a time. Uh, panicking uh, obviously is never helpful. And I think what we want to do is offer a pathway uh, here in our program for patients uh, to get everything they need. And, and we will kind of shepherd the patient along the way 
and that's kind of uh, you know comforting, I think, for for most patients. So I think first step is don't panic, uh, and then second step is is find the right people to help take care of you, and uh, we're of course uh, happy uh, and eager to help. Um, and uh, I would say the only other thing as a pulmonologist is uh, if you if you smoke, uh, try to stop, and we can help do that too. You know, it's and I was only being a partially facetious when I said panic is kind of the the natural because I, I think for a lot of people it that's just the natural Absolutely. reaction and you don't want to you want to be calm and cool and and you two and your teams are really good at helping people through that situation because initially when you're when you're, you're faced with something like that it everything kind of just goes over your head but that's part of what you do and, and Dr. Hogarth I don't know if you can talk to us a little bit about you know what how do you work with the patients because I know this is a a, a very complex situation you, you, the communication is important with the patients. Can you kind of walk us through that? What happens? Sure. You know, what I always tell people is that there's a, there is a long list of things that the nodule could be, mm -hmm. but in reality, if you're a patient, there's only two things. It's either cancer or everything else. And so part of our discussion is what's the probability that this nodule that you have on your CAT scan, is it actually cancer or not? What's that chance? And we have a, a series of you know, other tests we can do. Some of them are blood-based tests. Some of them are just reevaluating the CAT scan you have. Um, there are characteristics of nodules that make them more concerning for cancer as opposed to less concerning. So first is just a discussion with you of what is the probability that this could be a malignancy for you. And, and this is important because in some cases, our plan for you is to get a follow-up CAT scan, is to do watch and wait and you say, well, wait, you, it could be cancer. The probability, if it's low enough, we don't want to do invasive things to you because the chance it's cancer is so low and every invasive procedure always carries a risk. So if the risk of cancer is low, but the risk of a complication is the same, I don't want to harm you, right? First, do no harm. <laughs> that's, that's an oath both of us took. <laughs> So we, we do want to remind our viewers, we'll take your questions for our experts. Just type them in the comment section. We'll try to get to as many as we can over the next half hour. And Dr. Walk, you mentioned as a pulmonologist, you tell people stop smoking. That's got to be number one on the list. And, and I would imagine in this, and I've got to work COVID in here because, you know, it's what we're talking about everywhere. Um, that's right. That's, that's another thing that you probably want to caution people about. Stopping smoking can help you just across the board, and, and, and that would be another area, I would imagine. Oh, yes, sir. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we are living in a strange time and, uh, you know, smoking is certainly a, a problem, uh, a historical problem that we're working to deal with every day. And, uh, you know, COVID makes it harder for, for patients to see doctors. And, but we do have avenues to help with that. I mean, we, we do have uh, telemedicine uh, options and, and there are uh, potential treatments to help uh, patients quit smoking as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that there's so many different uh, possibilities when it comes to uh, management that we're quickly learning uh, how to uh, utilize technology, even even in telehealth, to help, uh, help patients get what they need. Yeah, and I, I want to tell people this is a very, very safe place. We, we are still operating. We're open for business. And the, probably the worst thing that could happen is that somebody would forego treatment that they need because they're they're afraid of COVID. We don't want that to happen. So oh, I, I'm gonna let me let me reinforce absolutely. that. Yeah, hospital is safe. The hospital is clean. I work here. I go home. I I kiss my children. I kiss my spouse. Like I'm not worried about spreading disease. Um, the we are extremely cautious about everything here, and we are going to be first and foremost interested in protecting you as well as protecting ourselves and our staff. But to delay any amount of care you know when you said at the very beginning i have a nodule should i panic no don't panic but also don't ignore it and don't delay it and as dr wog just said we are able to do video visits and televisits i can meet with you virtually if it bothers you to come near the medical center fine let's do it via via the computer and let's go through your cat scan and let's have this discussion about what our next step is you know in fact just to even further hammer home that point, even the show that we're doing right now. You two are remote. Uh, we're in, in very separate areas. 
I'm in the studio all by myself, as you can see here. There's nobody else here. We don't even have any camera people in here. That's why I'm not moving a lot. Not that I move a lot anyway. But uh, we're very careful about that, and, that's, and we're very serious about that, and it's, it's, it's important here. We are taking questions from viewers. We do have one that I want to get to, and, and either one of you can jump on this one. Maybe, Dr. Hogarth, you could start. Uh, the question is, how quickly do cancerous lung nodules grow compared to other types of cancer, and how urgently must uh, patients act? No, it's a great question. Um, the fear always is, is that you know cancers are going to grow. Every tumor, of course, has its own biology at the speed at which it grows. But generally speaking, um, a lung cancer, when someone says to you, hey, we want to get a follow-up CAT scan, um, the reason they're suggesting that is that the nodule you have is so small or has characteristics that are so st uh, convincing that it's benign that that two, three-month interval that they've suggested, the, the amount of, you know, if I'm wrong and it's actually a cancer, the amount that it's going to grow in that time period is so small that what we've we've not lost anything. You will still be the same stage. There's what and what we've gained, of course, is for all of those scans that nothing changed and you avoided an unnecessary invasive procedure. So, and Dr. Wag, maybe you can take this next one. So, what are some of the options to evaluate lung nodules and lung masses? Uh, we can talk about in imaging modalities, and sure. Dr. Hogarth mentioned blood tests even a, a few moments ago. Yeah, yeah there's several uh, uh, possibilities uh, in that regard to evaluate these. I mean, the first thing is first is, you know, we do have lung cancer screening, uh, which we uh, offer patients CAT scans if they're eligible and have a smoking history, and you can speak with your physician about that uh, or come and visit a, a lung uh, physician. Um, but uh, many times you might notice something on an x-ray, uh, you know, that is not a, that's not part of the screening uh, mode, uh, pathway, but uh, a, a doctor may see something on a chest x-ray, but also CAT scanning. Uh, and then there are other uh, types of imaging uh, techniques like PET scans, uh, where we, uh, other, uh, images that we use to uh, evaluate lung nodules. Um, and so those are, you know, uh, our mainstays of, of imaging. Um, but there's there's many other tests. Uh, Dr. Hogarth uh, uh, kind of briefly uh, said something about the blood tests, uh, but of course there's uh, biopsies, there's uh, all, all kinds of different tests. We even use uh, risk, uh, in order to evaluate a patient's risk, we use uh, calculators to help uh, evaluate that too, uh, uh, based on patient's history and, and imaging findings. So, go ahead, Dr. Hogarth. Did you have something you wanted to add? Just to, just to echo what Dr. Wog said, there's, there's, there's large databases that have been built off of the experience of, of radiology to be able to essentially plug in and give a, a number. Hey, this nodule has a 20% chance of being cancer which is not a number anybody wants to hear, but of course there's an 80% chance it's not cancer. So before we go and suddenly just remove a whole portion of your lung, let's slow down for a second and do things right. Some of the blood tests we have have the ability to change that number. You know, we go, oh, it was a 20% chance. Well, the blood test actually showed that it's less than 5%. Well, less than 5%, okay, let's slow down a little bit. The whole key thing too is, is that this is an ongoing dialogue between us and the patient. We're not going to just say, you must do this. We're going to give you some strong recommendations, but we're also going to work with you. And every patient is different. Maybe maybe a 3% chance of cancer is acceptable to some and terrifying to others and everywhere in between. But we also want to explain to you what we're going to do to actively follow you. What you're never going to hear from us is to say, now nah, there's nothing to do, leave. <laughs> we're going to tell you a outline plan that is backed up with data as to why we're doing this. So I want to get back to biopsies for just a moment, and we had a question from a viewer that, that dovetails perfectly into what I'm kind of curious about, and, and that is, you know, how, the, how biopsies work, and Janet wants to know how invasive is a lung biopsy, and I was fortunate enough, I think, gosh, it's been over a year ago, it was way pre-COVID, but uh, you showed me one piece of equipment that you had, Dr. Hogarth, it was pretty fascinating to see what you could do inside of a person's lung with a very, very minor um, very minor invasive procedure. I mean, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about that and walk us through that? Yeah, sure. And then um, uh, I'll, I'll have a Jay echo in as well. So look, okay. there's three ways to sample inside the lung. There's a surgeon who's going to go in and cut part of it out. And obviously, you know, even with minimally invasive surgery, it's still a surgery. They're still cutting in you. There's also what's called a needle biopsy where uh, it's basically put right through your chest into the lung nodule done through the radiology department. 
And th that, you know, these procedures all have their own benefits, but also their own complications. What Dr. Wog and I do is a procedure called bronchoscopy. So we go through your mouth. Your lungs are gonna be ultimately attached to your mouth. Why aren't we just following the pathway down? We're fortunate enough here at U Chicago Medicine to have a robotic endoscope that lets us get to parts of the lung we've never been able to get to before. We use that CAT scan, build a three-dimensional map of your lungs, and we drive to the spot where that's at, pass instruments out, take little pieces that we, so you're not gonna miss anything, um, you know, volume-wise. And we do it through your mouth so there's no cutting. So when we're done, you go home, and our complication rate is the lowest amongst the three, and we have a high success rate to get you an answer. And where this matters is, of course, if I go and prove that it's not a cancer, then rather than being cut open and proved it was not a cancer, which is great, it's not cancer, but you've been cut open. Instead, you might have a little sore throat for a day or two. That's not, that's not hard to convince someone. <laughs> so, so Dr. Wag, it was interesting because th this is it's almost like a video game. I, I remember when uh, Dr. Hogarth showed this to me, it, it's, it's, it's almost, you know, again, it's like a video game, science fiction. It's pretty amazing. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about what the patient experiences in, in this procedure and, and how, how minimal it actually is? Yeah, so uh, a patient typically comes in, it's, uh, you know, basically just for a few hours uh, during the day. You can't eat after midnight, uh, but you come in, uh, we have a pre-procedural area where the patients get kind of their IV and get, uh, you know, sign a few papers and then they come to our lab and uh, we ha are uh, lucky enough to have uh, anesthesiologists who help take care of the patient during the procedure. Um, and uh, then we go in with our scopes uh, and we get the tissue that we need and the patient goes uh, afterwards to a post, uh, post procedural area where they recover and uh, hopefully go home uh, if nothing happens. Uh, I do think uh, that it's worth saying that you know, complications are pretty rare with the scopes, uh, the endoscopy that we perform. And uh, I do also think it's worth mentioning that by doing the bronchoscopy, as opposed to choosing an alternative technique, uh, such as a needle biopsy, uh, we're also able to evaluate the lymph nodes in the chest. And that's a very important part uh, for a cancer evaluation. Uh, and so that becomes one procedure as opposed to multiple procedures. So, so talk to us a little bit more about the lymph nodes, and either one of you can do that. What exactly goes on there, and why is that so, so critical? Well, if you have a cancer, the next question is, what stage is it, yeah. right? And so the lymph nodes are where cancer would spread to first. So if we think you're an early stage cancer, that's great. I wanna know you're an early stage cancer. And so as Dr. Wong just pointed out, in the same procedure, after we've just proved that that is a cancer, we're gonna then go sample your lymph nodes so that when we wake you up, I'm not happy that I have to tell you it's cancer, but what I can also tell you is it's cancer, here's what stage it is, and so now you're gonna to go to the surgeon to be cured, or you're gonna to go to radiation or you know whatever. You don't have to go get another procedure that's gonna take time to then figure out what stage you are. I'll also point out that our procedures, like Dr. Wog said, are done under anesthesia. This isn't that twilight, you're out. You will not know we're doing this to you. You are comfortable, we're gonna do our work, you're going to go home. So I have two from viewers that I have to pass along. These are not questions, um, but I, I love these, so I always have to do this. Elizabeth says, I've had several bronchoscopes done by Dr. Hogarth. He's amazing, uh, so that's nice. Karen says, your pulmonary department <laughs> is the best. So a little bit of a fan club going here, but that's, that's, that's awesome. Now, a question. Uh, Elizabeth, this is, we'll get you a card. We'll get you <laughs> I don't know. We could we could get you a plaque or something. This is, uh, but that's nice. And and again, I, I, I in all Thank seriousness, really I kind. think no, that shows kind. really you know the work that you do with the patients, and that's very important because it's a difficult time in people's lives when they have something like this done. So this is a this is an actual question. Uh, Amit, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Can an 11 millimeter nodule be biopsied by that bronchoscope method uh, through the throat? Go ahead, Jay. Well, it, it certainly can. Um, when we, uh, I mean, it, it, and, and I'll also say it, it depends, but we, we can. Uh, 11 millimeters is rather small. And uh, that's sort of when we take a look at the CAT scan very closely. Uh, we evaluate whether or not uh, it's a target that we can, we can reach. 
Uh, we look at the air airways and, and other uh, uh, parts of our computer modeling uh, to see if that's something that we can get to. And we also try to figure out, is it a lesion that requires biopsy or should we offer something else? Uh, if you're concerned about cancer and there's a, a, an intermediate pretest probability based on a, a calculated uh, evaluation, uh, then we can potentially offer a blood test or something else uh, that may uh, potentially reduce the risk or, or, or suggest that the pretest probability is lower. So, Interesting. Another question from a viewer, and this is Carla, and this is a little bit inside baseball, so I'm going to have you ask, answer the question, but also kind of explain what she's, what she's asking here. Uh, is following a nodule uh, ground glass opacity with yearly CT standard when there are no changes from scan to scan? And I don't know, Dr. Hogarth, you want to start on that one? Sure. That's so. So a, a ground glass nodule is is definitely a different thing than a very solid nodule. A ground glass nodule almost looks like some wispy smoke on the CAT scan, if you will. So ground glass nodules um, are a different biology. Um, in some cases, they are a precancerous lesion. In other cases, they are actually a cancer. But for many people, an extremely, extremely slow-growing cancer, and one that has a very low invasive potential, meaning it's technically a cancer, but it's never going to necessarily bother you. And one of the reasons we do this yearly image, because it is so slow-growing, if it's not changing year after year, then the probability that it's going to do anything to you becomes so low that we don't we actually leave you alone then, because why would I put you, why would I cure you of something that's never going to harm you? Now, these are complicated discussions. Uh, you know, it's not just a like, oh yeah, do this. But when it's time to get a follow-up scan, the reason that ultimately for these ground glasses, why they settle into yearly, is precisely because once they're slow growing, um, we, we, if you keep scanning you, we're never gonna see change and we're also gonna just keep radiating you. Now, solid nodules, depending on the size, there are guidelines that suggest the interval of scans. And we keep spacing that interval of scan out if nothing has changed. Obviously, if things change, then that's a discussion towards biopsy. That ground glass, if it gets larger or denser, then it's changing. And the individual tumor biology is changing, so we need to get going and do something about it. Interesting. So, Dr. Wong, you, you, you touched on this a little bit before, but can you kind of walk us through what people can expect before, during, and after one of these procedures? Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, you know, typically we'll have a clinic evaluation, and that could be in person, um, or it could be a tele telemedicine visit. Um, then, you know, based on that discussion, uh, we would set a patient up for a procedure. And we kind of, we have a, a nice uh, staff who will kind of walk the patient through what they should expect. Uh, and that uh, usually, uh, you know, we discuss medications, uh, if the patient is on a blood thinner, uh, whether, you know, the, the fact that they can't eat uh, the night before because, um, you know, we do uh, general anesthesia for many of our cases. Um, and then afterwards, uh, once we uh, settle on a, on a date, uh, the patient comes in, uh, they come into the sky lobby here at U Chicago, uh, uh, and then they wait to be brought to the pre-procedural area. And at that point, they'll meet the anesthesiologist, uh, the nursing staff, and uh, you know they'll double check everything, make sure everything looks right, that it would be safe to proceed. And then at that point, we would bring the patient back to the, our laboratory, and uh, there we perform our procedures and then once, uh, once that's completed, we send the patient to the post-procedural area where they recover for a couple hours, uh, and then they just go home. And it's usually about, uh, you know, a half day's worth of time. Interesting. And so, Dr. Hogarth, we have another question from a viewer. This is from Therese, and it is, would my annual low-dose CT lung cancer screening show nodules, or does it have to be a higher-dose CT screening? That's a great question. No, it will show the nodules. That's why we do it. And then the fact is the low dose is because you are being screened, there is no other reason we're scanning you. So we want to all, I mean, we want to do this for everybody. We want to minimize radiation. But if it shows anything of any concern, if, especially if it's your first one, um, that may require a follow-up scan at a shorter interval or one with slightly higher radiation. I should point out 
the, the amount of radiation you get from a CAT scan in a center like ours. So it has everything to do with the quality of the scanners. And as you can imagine, a place like UChicago Medicine, we've got the highest quality CT scanners. We're giving you the least amount of radiation, even for what's called a diagnostic scan, because it has everything to do with the quality of the machine for the radiation that goes through. So you're gonna get way more bang for your buck, literally as a, as a scan um, by coming here. But you know, one of the other things when we were talking about the, the patient journey, so, so Dr. Wag and I have our partner, Dr. Murgu. We also have literally the world's greatest nurse practitioner, Kimberly. And between the four of us, we're all in clinic at any given moment. So if you have an abnormality, the other thing that sets this place apart is if you call a, a regular hospital and say, hey, I've got a lung nodule, can I see somebody? You will get seen three to four weeks from now. And the national standard is roughly five weeks. You will get seen within a week, every time here. And if someone ever by mistake says to you, yeah, they can see you in three months, you need to raise a fit because we will always see you. We will overbook you. You will never be told you've got to wait around to be seen after someone's told you you might have cancer. That is not acceptable to make you wait. Yeah, I can't even imagine the, what, what that would be like if you're, you're worried that you have cancer and then you're told you have to wait for an extended period of time. It's gonna be terrible. Exactly. So, so can we talk a little bit about just screening for lung cancer in general and, and, and what people need to know? Because I, I know there are some folks that will go through a regular process of, of screening. I don't know who wants to take that one. Go ahead, Ajay. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you know, we do have a regular process of, of lung cancer screening. We want to find patients who have a history of smoking, uh, quit uh, within the past 15 years, uh, ages uh, usually 55 to 80. Uh, and, um, you know, those patients typically uh, are eligible for uh, low-dose lung cancer screening. And that would be annually until they kind of uh, exit out after that 15 years. Uh, it is covered by insurance and, um, you know, it is extremely valuable. Now, the low-dose lung cancer screening has its own set of guidelines that helps us to, to monitor and follow uh, any suspicious nodules. So follow-up scans could also be low-dose as well. Um, and so that's, it's, it would, I do think it needs to be corrected that you should not get a chest X-ray as a screening tool. It should be a CAT scan if you are eligible. You know, you, you mentioned that being covered by insurance. Is the evaluation and procedure that we've been talking about, is that covered by uh, insurance as well? That's always the question people want to know. For sure. No, for sure. Yeah. Our, 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 uh, our fancy robot that's going to let us go everywhere in the lung is definitely covered by insurance. That's, that's good to know. Well, gentlemen, we're out of time. You were, you were fantastic. You shared really some good information with our audience, so <laughs> appreciate that. And thank you to our viewers for your great questions, really, really good questions today. Please remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs that are coming up in the future. Also, if you want more information about UChicago Medicine, take a look at our website at uchicagomedicine.org. All kinds of fantastic information there. It's a wonderful website, and it also has a lot of great COVID information. So if you need an appointment, give us a call at 888-824-0200. We want to remind people, very important, do not forego medical care during COVID. It's, it's so important. This is a safe place. And remember, you can schedule your video visit by also going to the website. Thanks again for being with us today, and I hope you have a great week.